Hello everybody and welcome back to Brewmasters where we're talking to accomplished homebrewers for D&D 5th edition. Today we're finishing up our conversation with the Angry GM, creator of TheAngryGM.com and publisher of Game Angry, How to RPG the Angry Way. If you want to see part 1 and 2, feel free to check out the previous videos, otherwise here's a quick summary of events so far. We've looked back at where D&D started, uh, its real impact on the world, the marketing, and even analysed some of the systems shining a light on exploration, combat, and character development. Today we're going to take a look at encounter design, the importance of choice, monsters, and NPC intelligence. Before we get to that though, here's a regular reminder to like and subscribe, and if you're enjoying the show, use Prestigitation to click that bell icon so you get a notification when the next episode goes up. And now we've just got a quick special offer to show you. Now if you're already interested in the sound of our guests, or who knows, it's almost Christmas. Well, good news, you can grab a copy of the Angry GM's book, Game Angry, How to RPG the Angry Way, with 10% off your print or electronic copy. Just head over to angry.game shop and use the code HOMEBREWERS. That's H-O-M-E-B-R-E-W-E-R-S, all one word, and that discount will work until December 31st. It's a great encapsulation of some of Angry's best GM advice for players and GMs alike. There's links in the description to make life easy for you, and if you're still not sold on it, let's hear some more wisdom from the man himself on this episode of Brewmasters. But we've gone through from uh, your first TTRPG experiences uh, to D&D not evolving, uh, to 5th edition design processes, to why 4th edition failed, to 5th edition design uh, involving player base, to the three pillars, to exploration, to Hollow Knight, to combat innovation, to uh, mechanical complexity, life expectancy and character investment, all the way through to mechanical approaches to character development and emergent storytelling. <laughs> Right, it sounds like someone took seven different books on game design, threw them in a paper shredder, swallowed <laughs> them, and then threw them up. <laughs> and that's our show, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, feel free to use that as your ag advertising copy. <laughs> uh, I'll put your quote on the uh, adverts from now on. <laughs> You might have to edit it down for space. It'll just be, it sounds like somebody threw up the angry GM. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, to be fair, it's been a really great conversation. Like you've answered some questions I've had since I started playing fifth edition. I haven't been able to put my finger on like, so like one massive thing that's really been pissing me off is like, I have a player group um, or at least I did. They now kind of, one of my players has become the lead GM. Um, but within our group, when we switch to fifth edition, like everyone in my group plays for different reasons and any other group would have broken up by now, but we're really good friends and we insist on punishing ourselves. And like, basically everyone contradicts someone else. And like, I've been trying for years. To I gotta tell you, your group is not as unusual as you think it is in that respect, but <laughs> that's actually very reassuring. <laughs> But like a big thing that the whole group agree on is that they like combat to be interesting. And in 3.5, that felt really natural because like you obviously have all that complexity that we talked about. And there was one fight that really stood out to my players. It was a really early one um, where they fought a... Oh, I'm not going to remember this monster's name. Um, it's like an undead creature and its gimmick is that when it attacks you, it also buries you. Okay. Um, and that fight was like so intense for that group, like, cause they were level like three, I think. And they really wanted me to like, give them a hard challenge. Cause I'd been bragging like, oh, you guys haven't really been fighting anything too tough. So I was like, ah, oh, the Entuma, that was it. And, okay. um, so I was like, okay, I'll make a big show of this and like threw them in against the creature. And it was like a desperate gnarly fight of trying to unbury one player at the same time as trying to distract the monster and not get killed you got one person healing you got another person focusing on unburying people some people already under the ground like suffocating and it was this ruthless fight that took the entire session and at the end of it i think the 
ranger's pet died. And it was like this awful, impactful, like heart-wrenching moment of realizing that they'd forgotten one of the bodies that had been buried. And um, like, I've never been able to really recreate that since then. And I think what we've talked about today goes a long way towards explaining maybe why. Um, I think the only time we came close was a similar fight, I think it's still in third edition maybe, where they were up against a horned devil. And it has this great gimmick where if it hits you with, um, I think a tail attack, like the stinger stays in you and deals damage over time. Um, and one of the players got hit by it and went down. So the moment they tried to heal the person, um, I threw in like a bit of a twist that it also negated healing because like the hellfire or something. Uh, so they had this like gasp moment of, oh, the, the, the game doesn't work how I think it does. Like why isn't this person getting back up from being dead? Like, <laughs> and then having to like investigate, find the stinger, like retract it. And then they can carry on the fight. Like these interesting subversions that I feel like just don't exist as naturally in fifth edition. They, well, no, they don't. Um, so, I mean, do you want me to tell you the secret? Hell yeah. Like, go for I it. mean, <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you exactly what it was in those two fights that is the lightning that you're trying to capture again. Um, it has to do with the fact that the player's goals were misaligned. Hmm. Okay. So here's the fight with the Entomber. On the one hand... They're trying to kill this monster. They have to kill it because it wants to kill them. So there's no, there, you know, one of the things has to die. The monster has to die. But the problem is it has buried some of those people alive. And so they have to unearth them. They have to dig them up because those people are going to suffocate and die. Mm. Okay. They can't do both at the same time. Right. So suddenly they have to decide moment by moment, which of those two things is more important? Which of them is more likely to work right now? Which of them is the bigger emergency? Which thing can I contribute to? Okay. The same with the, the was it a wyvern? Uh, the, the horned the, devil. The horned devil. Oh, I love horned devils. I'm sorry. <laughs> same thing with the horned devil. Okay. Normally, the healer can heal on the bounce, right? Run past, you know, spend one action, heal, done, you're up. Mm. But now they can't. The Horned Devil's still running around. It still has to be fought. But now we don't know what this, what's wrong with this person or when they're going to die. Claire can't ignore them because who knows if they're even getting death saves now. What is going on? <laughs> I got to fix this now. Okay. In... 99.999% of D&D combats, the players have two goals and they're absolutely aligned. Survive and kill the monsters. In those two combats, survive and kill the monsters were mutually exclusive. Interesting. <laughs> okay. So what you created there was a dilemma. There was a choice. You can't do both. Th There's two things you want. You can't have them both. Which is more important right now? <laughs> so then the players have to juggle. Well, which is more important right now? Which is more urgent right now? What are we going to do? Do we dig up? And in the end, the players paid for the choice with the, the ranger's pet's life. Mm. So as they come away from that, why is that meaningful? Because every one of them is now sitting there saying, we forgot about the, the, the dog or the wolf or whatever it was. We forgot mm. about Scruffy. If we had spent just, if I had been paying better attention, Scruffy wouldn't be dead. Or if instead of attacking, I had gone to find Scruffy, Scruffy wouldn't be dead. Or if we had killed the monster faster, then maybe Scruffy would have survived when we dug him up. Okay. All the players are looking at that right now and thinking, what could we have done differently? Okay. Whereas if the fight had just been a straight up fight, it's, gee, maybe I chose the wrong attack. Or, eh, it sucks. The dice killed the dog. <laughs> 
Yeah, but in that situation, right, there was a dilemma. The players had to resolve it. There's no right answer because they, they didn't even have all the information they needed. Mm. You know, how long does someone live underground for? You know, what was wrong with the poisoned character? Who knows? But you created a dilemma. You put the players in a situation where they couldn't accomplish both of their goals at the same time. Each player individually had to decide which goal was more important for themselves and the party. Okay. D and D does not do that enough. Okay. It, in fact, D and D is not written to do that. Yeah, it almost it, avoids it. <laughs> well, that's because those things are hard, mm. and because there's almost no strat. Like you could, like at the end of the, if the players were the sort of players where they would debate their strategy endlessly, because some groups are like that, they could have debated the entumer, entumer fight forever. And yeah. played all the different what if scenarios and never have figured out what the optimal strategy wouldn't have been because there wasn't one. Mm. It's just in this moment, what risk are you willing to take right now? Because you have to take some risk. You have to leave someone buried if you want to go attack the monster. You know? Yeah, you have to sacrifice something. Right. There's a cost. Well, there, it's a dilemma. It's a conflict. It's an internal conflict. Choice, real choice, is the act of resolving an internal conflict. There are multiple things you want or multiple things you want to avoid, and you cannot have them all. Hmm. That is what a choice is. Okay. There's a difference, by the way, between a choice and a decision. Okay. Hmm. And the, the difference is... It's a conflict, okay? Decision, like, you can make a totally mechanical decision, right? Like, you go to the store, there's a thing you want to buy. You know, there's a new video game on, at the store. One store is selling it for $50, one store is selling it for $40. Where do you buy it? Well, the cheapest store. Right. There's no choice there. There was no dilemma, right? I see, yeah. But... What if the store that's selling it cheaper is also a store that, that you know, burns down puppy orphanages in third world countries? <laughs> now you have a moral choice. Well, it, but what, more like people say moral choice, but that's still just choice. It's just a dilemma. Because mm. in this case, you have two goals. You want the game at the cheap. You, actually, you have three goals. You want the game. You want as much money in your pocket as you can have. And you want to be a good person. True. Which of those three things is more important? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But that, that's what makes choice meaningful. Because it's those choices, those are the ones that reveal you as a person. Okay? True. The person who is willing to buy the game cheaper from the puppy orphanage burning store... Uh, I don't even know how that business model works, but it's got to, because they're turning a profit, so it's got to do something. The person who buys it has said something about the relative value of video games, the dollar in their pocket versus the lives of puppies in third world countries. They have said something they believe, whether they have meant to or not. Hmm. Okay. The cleric who does not leave the person when they are down and does not give them up for dead even if it means ignoring the fight, is saying something about what they value. True. Because, because some clerics could have looked down and said, oh, my spell didn't work, probably dead. I don't know what's wrong, but we got to kill this devil. <laughs> Otherwise, we'll all end up like that. Mm. Okay? Something about the character is being revealed. Okay. Something about the characters was revealed with the entombed. They're really bad at taking care of their pets. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. If you lose track of a beloved dog during while you're fighting an undead abomination, you're not a very good pet owner. <laughs> I will. Well, if she heard you say that, she would kill you. But. <laughs> <laughs> I will, I will uh, say in her defense. I'm hoping that she, like you, are on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean then. <laughs> well, that, that's true, yeah. 
But yeah, it was a, it was one of those, I think both of those fights were already quite frenetic. Like the players were, uh, it was like, it was very intense. And obviously because things mattered moment to moment, like every character, every player at least um, on their turn felt like what they were about to do was going to change the game. Like right. if I don't make the right decision, someone's going to die. Like, Right. And that's a huge element that just doesn't exist in typical combat, usually. You mean, you mean the fear of death? Or you mean just the, 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 the resolving of a dilemma, an urgent dilemma? I think more so feeling like your decisions matter. Because, like, so often my players will be sitting there just waiting for their turn to cast the spell they're going to cast or to make the attack they're going to make. And maybe like you said earlier, the thing they're going to think about at the time is where do I move? What attack do I use? And that's their turn. And they're just waiting for the moment to do that. Like it's almost inconvenient to them to have to wait on other players to make that same choice because it's boring. <laughs> well, that's because, right. Well, there's that because again, like, this is what I'm saying is what you did in those two fights is you changed the choices they had to make. Mm. If the only choice they made was where do I move and where do I do, how do I deal my damage this turn? They're leaving their companions buried in the ground to suffocate. Or at the very least, they're leaving their companions buried in the ground, gradually reducing manpower to the point where the the monster doesn't have or the, the wizard doesn't have a meat shield between him and the monster. Yeah. Whatever, however you set that value, that is still a substantial issue. Okay. But the point is in at the end, is they weren't like when you are Okay, so I distinguish between the words decide and choose. Mm. Choosing is resolving a dilemma. Deciding is basically answering a math problem. I see. Okay. When you are deciding what attack to use and where to stand, it's usually pretty easy to figure that out. It's usually pretty easy to figure out what's best. And D&D is very forgiving if you choose... Eh, slightly the wrong attack or you, you stand in just the wrong spot. Okay. It'll let you off the hook, mm. but you're still just making decisions and there's nothing interesting about making a decision. It just proves that you're really good at math <laughs> or, you know, or, you know, in this case, probability, or in this case, reading the narrative and determining which element the monster is vulnerable to whatever it is that drives that decision. Okay. That's still all you're doing is you're just making a decision. What, how do I deal my damage and where do I stand? It's not interesting because decisions aren't interesting. There's nothing interesting about watching someone optimize, a, solve a problem of optimization. True. Okay. What's interesting is when there are two things someone wants and they're in opposition and the person has to choose one. Yeah, there's drama because, inherent in that, right? Right. Well, because, okay, all stories are about human beings, right? Even the ones about robots and pretend elves. Hmm. Okay. We read stories, we enjoy stories because they teach us how to think. They teach us how to be human. And we are, human beings are naturally interested in other human beings because... We, we have evolved over 50,000 years to be social creatures. Our entire universe is not the scientific universe. It's not governed by physics. It's governed by human relationships. Mm. Okay. Well, let, let me ask you a question. What is affecting your life right, more, right now more? The universal law of gravitation... Or the fact that we have, as a global society, had to decide how we value and protect human lives to decide what to do in the face of a global pandemic. <laughs> Which one of those things is more important to you right now today? To me personally. <laughs> okay. Yeah. 
<laughs> Do you see what I'm saying, though? Yeah, the, yeah. I'm being the silly. The world we narrate, the world we navigate is the world of human interaction. Okay? Hmm. That's what all our stories are about. They're all about teaching us how to be human and how to coexist with other humans. The reason it is interesting to watch a, someone make a choice, not, not make a decision, make a choice, hmm. is because it reveals the person inside. The cleric who won't leave their ally behind on the ground is saying something about who they are as a person. The cleric who does leave the ally behind to fight the devil is saying something about who they are as a person. Just as the cleric who looks at the situation, sees their spells have failed, and then collapses into despair because they think their god has abandoned them and will not do anything, is saying something about themselves as a person. Hmm. Just as the player who stands up yells that the GM is a killer GM, that the rule book says specifically that the spell is supposed to work this way, and then slams the book down and storms out because he believes you're always screwing him this way, <laughs> is saying something about himself as a person. Hmm. Okay? This is, this is why we tell stories. This is why we play games, to train ourselves to be human. I mean, this is very, like, very bottom level here, okay? Choices are interesting because they reveal people. Interactions are interesting because they reveal people, hmm. okay? We, we learn everything we know about other human beings in two ways, the choices they make and when we talk to them, which is why those are the things that are interesting in stories, okay? It's why... Characters that have no agency are bland characters. You, you know the sort of characters I'm talking about, the characters where everything just happens for them. Yeah. That exercise no control over the world, that have done nothing to get themselves in the position they're in. They're not interesting because they're not even human at that point. Mm. You know? So we don't want to know about them. They're not useful to us. They don't show us anything. You know? And honestly, there's survival wrapped up in it. Like, being really good at role-playing games is a matter of human survival. Because when you start to recognize in the story of the game, the cleric who will not abandon someone when they are down versus the cleric who will run away versus the cleric who will be so focused on the fight they won't even notice that you fell. <laughs> you learn something about how to recognize the people who will stand by you the people who will fall apart and the people who will fight for you, mm. which is useful to know when you're forming human relationships. Your brain is absorbing all of this information and your brain can't tell the difference between a fictional character and a real person. So by playing the game and watching this cleric, so what is it about that cleric that said, this is the person who will not leave you when you're down, or this is the person who will stand between you and a monster because that's the best thing they can do in this situation, or this is the person who just falls apart and panics when they feel like they can't contribute anymore. What mm. are those things? Because I need to know that for real. I, mean, I know I'm putting a lot of, like, th this is a lot to put on a role-playing game and a lot to put <laughs> on a combat with a, with a bearded devil, a, 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 yeah, yeah, a horned devil. Yeah. But here you go. You want to know why your brain responds to this stuff? This is it. Well, no, I mean, it's still, it's still applicable. Like, I think you say it's like, this is all just the basics, but I think sometimes we do need to remember the fundamentals to be able to properly analyze things. Like, these problems of why these situations hit so hard at the time i've not been able to properly like deconstruct them in this way right no th th but well, i didn't say this was basic i said this was the bottom this is the root mm. okay this is the deep core of why stories it, you know fascinate people this is the deep core of why we play games are a way we test ourselves all animals test themselves through play. Kittens learn how to fight by playing with the other kittens in their litter. Okay. We, we learn our survival skills through play. 
Our lives are all about humans and understanding the humans around us. A role-playing game is a game experience about stories. It's about humans. Mm. We are, you're basically learning the survival skills you need to survive a social world. That's why role-playing games appeal. I mean, at their core. There's layers on top of that. Like the people who like exploration or the people who like this or the people who like that or the people who just want to shut their brains off and escape. Okay, that's all on top of this this deep fundamental craving that your brain has for A, stories, and B, games. Hmm. Your brain is hardwired to want stories and games. The stories and games that appeal to you most have more to do with higher level preferences. But stories are about people. Games are about training yourself. <laughs> you know? And what are the things we have to do most? We have to interact socially and we have to resolve dilemmas. We have to make choices. It's a role-playing game. But that's the secret. You want, I mean, simple, simple one, the training wheels encounter. When you build an encounter, next time you build an encounter, mm-hmm. okay, ask yourself what it is about that encounter that either, um, yeah, what is it about this encounter that either requires the players to do something different than what they always do or is particularly vulnerable to what the players always do? Okay, because sometimes you want their tactics to work really well, right? Sometimes you want mm-hmm. the tactics to, to not work so well. But what is it about the terrain? What is it about this particular combination of monsters? What is it about this ability on this monster that is going to make the players say, we have to do something different? You know? What is, what is it about... The ghosts are coming out of the walls. We have to move away from the walls. I, that seems simple enough. But because then you build on those patterns. Is now, you've, you know, now you've gotten the players to do this thing. What if that thing is now the worst thing? You see what I mean? Hmm. It's a constant game of what is it about this specific situation that will change what the players do? Okay, because if they're not constantly having to think about what they're doing, then it does become a rote matter of, okay, this is the spell I cast. Okay, this is the spell I cast. Okay, this is the attack I make. Wait for my turn. Roll the attack. Yay, I hit. Here's the damage. Okay, next (laughs) turn. Now I just Mm. wait. And I mean, that's the thing, too, is the players have so little ability to affect each other's actions that nobody has to care what happens on anyone else's turn. True. True. You know, because again, it comes down to choice. Where are you standing? Okay, am I st- where am I standing? Am I still safe here? Okay, good. Can I still attack? Because the, the choice of where I'm standing comes down to two things, what you want to interact with and what you want to avoid. If you're a melee fighter, you have to stand next to the enemy because you want to attack, interact with the enemy. You know, if you're, if you're a ranged fighter, you want to stand behind cover because you don't want to get shot or hurt. And that's the end of it, you know? These are all very simple decisions to make. And so they're not engaging. They're not interesting. You know, it's when the tactics stop working or when the tactics work really well. Because that, that can be very effective too. When the players realize that, they're do, that doing just the right thing is destroying this encounter, they get excited. Interesting. You know? yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, because you cannot get in the mindset as a GM of looking at every encounter in terms of, okay, how does this screw up the player's tactics? (laughs) Eventually people do get tired of that game. Mm. (laughs) You know, I mean, that was the original tomb of horrors was essentially written as a series of encounters that gradually screwed up every tactic. The players had learned through their entire course of playing the game. (laughs) That's how it was. That's how it added challenge. Okay, there were many encounters in the original Tomb of Horrors that were predicated on the idea that a character's ability to do something just didn't work in this encounter. You know, elves used to get a bonus to spotting secret doors. So there's one secret door in the Tomb of Horrors that says, oh, and by the way, elves don't get the bonus now. (laughs) Why? Because F you, that's why. 
<laughs> okay. That yeah. was how Tomb of Horrors built challenge. It just gradually invalidated every player's tactic. Okay. It invalidated the, if you kill the boss of the dungeon, you win tactic. <laughs> because halfway through, there's a fake lich. Yeah, yeah. Right? Remember, the GM is encouraged to let the players, you know, say, okay, we beat the lich, go home, and then make fun of them three weeks later. <laughs> it's like, by the way, remember the lich you thought you killed? Nope, that was the fake lich. Yeah, and it like pretends like that the place is going to cr crumble or collapse. Right? Yeah, it's, like, it's, it it's, scares you it's out got the fake, yeah, it's a fake load bearing boss. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, that's, that's how it So you can't build the whole, okay, how is this going to screw the players over this time every time you build a combat? Mm. But you can build the, okay, how is this going to change what the players do? Okay, because there's a difference between screwing and changing. You know? In D&D, yeah. &D, unless you're willing to write all your own monsters, which is crazy and something that I would never recommend, even though I do it i do not run any monsters out of the book anymore not a single one you know, i i rewrite my own goblins and they're almost <laughs> the goblins in the book but they work better hmm. but you know but if you're limiting yourself to just what's in D, D, you only have two real choices to work with and that is where am i standing what am i attacking or how am i attacking so you start there Every time you build a combat, it's like, okay, how is this going to change the decision of where am I standing? Okay, how is this going to change the decision of how am I attacking? You know, even if it's just little things, because you start small and then you grow, right? And then gradually you work yourself up to the bigger decisions of realizing there's two goals in every combat, kill the monsters and survive. Mm. What if you can't do both? What if killing the monsters? Like, hypothetically, what if um, there is a monster uh, that you, uh, it's, it, as soon as you started fighting with it, it's psychologically, it psychically bonded itself to one of the characters. <laughs> so that every time you hit it, the character it was bonded to took psychic damage. Hmm. Okay, well, now suddenly that's a complicated dynamic because obviously everyone wants to survive, but you also have to kill the monster. Now what? <laughs> yeah. Uh, don't steal that either. That's a monster that, I'm ac that I actually was just writing up for something. <laughs> but, you know. Like well, I mean, you, you say that, but like the, that kind of idea feels exactly like what um, Matthew Colville's action oriented monsters were kind of trying to go for yeah yeah definitely um, uh, but see I, I don't disagree there but I think what was what was missing from the idea that kind of got in the way is that is the sort of really base level understanding of the difference between decisions and choices. Mm. And be, because if you, if you do what I'm doing now, you don't need to go so far as he went. Yeah. You can do it within the framework. Like it doesn't have to be like that the monster has some like crazy abilities or like the way that it functions is unique. It can just be an element of the environment or. Right. Like yeah. the terrain, or, like you were saying. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, even something as simple as, oh, okay, uh, the end of Phantom Menace, the fight with Darth Maul mm. in the in the in the feed power station with the you remember the scene? Yeah, yeah. With the yeah, yeah. the uh, the the force fields that kept opening and closing, which I don't know what the heck point those things served <laughs> in the power station, and there really should have been some signage there that said, like, you know, warning, force field engages and disengages at random, keep hands clear. But, you know, <laughs> these things are going on and off and on and off, and yeah. <laughs> they divided up the combatants. And so now, where are you standing if you don't pay attention to that decision 
at all times, then at whatever time the force fields change the layout of the battlefield, that decision can really screw you over. Mm. And then you might not be able to get to your master when he gets stabbed by the th- by the Sith Lord. Yeah, because like, I mean, Matthew Colville's idea is a good one, but it's not there to solve the problem of making combat more interesting. It makes monsters more interesting, right? Right, okay, that's that's a really good way of saying it. It's it's missing the problem and f- and seeing the problem it must be in monster design. Mm. He sees the problem. He sees the same problem that we've been talking about now. And to his credit, for the problem he identified, it's a really good solution. Yeah. Okay. Again, I'm not. I I I made one joke about about strongholds and followers, and I do feel <laughs> bad about that because in the end, it was it was actually a, a really good product within the D and D framework. And I, I, you know, but by the same token, it's if you go beyond that problem to really dig down to the bedrock. You know, this, this sort of, it's almost a mental bedrock. It's like, why is this, why is combat interesting to begin with? Well, why is anything interesting to begin with? Why is a choice interesting? And I realize that there's a lot of digging you have to do to get to that point to solve that problem. But, you know, so he, he solved a problem in an interesting way. You know, but, but there, is a, there is a bigger problem underneath it. You know? Because honestly, then you can really work within D&D's framework. Still, if you're willing to break out of it, you can do even more interesting things. I mean, um, one of the rules I've toyed with is a telegraphing rule. Hmm. That is that um, monster... I can't remember the exact phrasing of this because I'm constantly changing the phrasing of things. (laughs) Wording things is the worst part of designing anything. Uh, yeah. Figuring out how to actually word the rules. But <laughs> so try this on your monsters. Monster has that one unique ability, right? Like uh, fire breath or, you know, the ability to cast a lightning spell or whatever it is, that one whammy ability. Yeah, it's gimmick. That, that, that the monster has, right. Okay. Okay. The monster must declare its intention to use that action at the end of the previous round. Hmm. <laughs> see, see what that changes. See what it changes if the dragon's intention to breathe fire must be declared at the end of its previous turn. Because you know what'll be really interesting is that the players will respond to it. Or at the very least, they'll decide whether, okay, you know, we're all in a good position to fight the dragon right now, but should we spread out? Should we try to get out of the range of its fire? Should we circle around it? We don't know which direction it's going to launch or who it's going to launch at or who it's going to try and catch. So what risks are we willing to take right now? Hmm. You know? Am I, you know, if, if, the, if the creature has an aura ability where it can explode and do damage to everyone adjacent to it, will the fighter move off? <laughs> I mean, will the fighter spend his precious one action to withdraw from the monster and get out of the range of the explosion? Or will he say, no, to heck with it, I still got to attack? Mm. You know? And what that also does is it forces the GM to telegraph the monster's next move when it's a big one. You know, because if like in video games, we talked about telegraphing. And one of the things you'll notice about telegraphing is the bigger the attack, the more there the more of a telegraph the monster gives. True. You know, the the basically there's more wind up the harder the punch. You know. Sure. You can see this you can see this in the cuphead bosses really well. There are more frames of animation telegraphing the bigger attacks. The short, simple attacks, the ones that do, do you know, the ones that are easy to avoid, <laughs> um, they or limited range or simple patterns, they're very, very hard to see coming. They only have a couple of frames of animation. The big ones, the, the giant like screen clearing attacks, those mm-hmm. have a lot of wind up. The ones that require you to be in a specific position, 
Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, but so the big attacks the monster makes now they have to be telegraphed. And the interesting thing, by the way, and I'm gonna, you know, because I want to brag about my own brilliance now. <laughs> If you do it this way, notice that I can put this monster in a book, you know, and just it has an ability that specifically says, um, like, at the, at the end of its turn as a bonus action, the monster can charge its fire breath. At mm. the start of its next turn, if the fire breath is charged, it can use the fire breath. You know, you just put these as conditions on the attacks. Sure. You know, um, and if it doesn't use the charge at the end of its turn, it loses it. Okay, so now freely as a bonus action at the end of a turn, it can charge up its fire breath. And then the next, what I'm doing is forcing the GM to telegraph, even though I never explained to them what telegraphing is or why they should do it. Hmm. The True. mechanics on the stat block make them do the thing that makes the game work best. Exactly. Yeah, like that's a huge thing that seems to be fi- missing from 5e monsters, in my opinion. <laughs> to, to, the 4E monsters, I actually think, were better designed than 5E monsters because if you played the monster, if you were trying to win with the monster, its best tactics were built into its stat block. And the book told you what how to use the monster. Like, it said on its first turn, it's probably best to do this, and then when they're in this position, do that. Like... <laughs> Which is funny because with the 4E monsters, what I'm saying is the book didn't really even need to say that stuff. Hmm. Yeah, it was all intrinsic. Right. It was built into the stat block. The way you should play that monster was, you know, like, uh, I I, I built, rebuilt zombies a while ago. Hmm. Okay. And one of the things, so zombies, you think about them, they hoard them, they hoard, and then they, they bite. Right, they grab someone, they try to drag them down, and they bite the person. Mm-hmm. That's your standard sort of John Romero movie zombies. Yeah. Right. Okay. So I could sit there and say, okay, you know, I give the so the the zombies have a grab attack and they have a bite attack, or you know, they have a punch attack and they have a bite attack, and then I can write a whole bunch of stuff that tells the GM, okay, so the zombies should grab, you know punch first and then bite and or the you know and the zombies should try to swarm anyone who's grabbed stuff like that or i can just say the zombies can only bite a grabbed target hmm yeah that's a significant okay. change <laughs> and then i would say okay the bite does the grab does almost no damage grab does like 1d4 damage and the bite does 2d8 damage so now any GM looking at that who's worth his salt is saying, man, I want to bite as much as I can, mm. right? But I can't bite unless I grab first. But once one zombie grabs someone, every zombie is going to come over and bite him. <laughs> so yeah. I have just built the swarming mechanic of zombies where once they disable one zombie, you know, once a zombie gets a hold of one target, everybody just kind of swarms on them and tries to take a bite. <laughs> I've just built that into the mechanics of the monster without having to tell the GM anything. Hmm. I've just made it the most, made the the right way to play the thing, the most obvious way to play. Exactly, yeah. So, so there, there's, there's a concept in video game design called first order optimal strategies or foos, hmm. right? First order optimal strategies are strategies that are obvious and easy for a player to see and that do really, really well. Okay. A first order strategy is the first thing you think of. That's what makes it a first order strategy. When you look at the situation, the first thing that occurs to you to try, that's your first order strategy. The easiest thing to do. Like the first Goomba in uh, Mario 1-1. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So the most obvious, Mario only has one move at that point, and that is jump. So the most obvious thing to do is try to jump on the monster and see what happens. Hmm. Okay. Um, the problem is when that first order strategy always works and works really well, nobody ever changes it up. And to, to build on <laughs> Super Mario Brothers, let's go to the, you remember the Hammer Brothers? Oh, yeah. (laughs) So they throw hammers, and they throw hammers in exactly the same arc as Mario's jump. 
I actually never noticed Which means that. <laughs> they do though. Oh yeah, go back and play it. And it's a very specific reason because it makes your strategy of jumping on the enemy the most dangerous way to approach a hammer brother. Hmm. So suddenly this strategy, your first order strategy, the most obvious, easy solution to every problem doesn't work. And now you have to figure out something else. Use a fireball if you have it, which requires you to survive with, a fire, with the fire flower power up long enough to get to the hammer brother or kick a Koopa shell at it or just try to avoid it. Run under it because they jump up and down, right? Yeah. Or like you can hit the block from underneath, I think. Right. Right. Exactly. So when your first order strategies fail you, you have to dig deeper. You go down to your second order, third order strategies, what have you. Okay. If your first order strategy absolutely always works, it is a first order optimal strategy. Do you, do you follow that? It's, it's the best thing to do is always the first thing you think of. Yeah, exactly. That is, and it's generally considered in video game design to be bad design. Mm. Okay. Because you do not want your players never, ever thinking beyond the first most obvious thing. Yeah, exactly. Right. right. You okay? Except this is where t the nature of tabletop role playing games completely screw this up. <laughs> First order optimal strategies are absolutely terrible things on a player character sheet. You do not want the player characters to never have to think about what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Which is, and that's basically the same advice I gave you when I said, okay, what about this encounter makes them do something different? Yeah. It's basically, basically now I'm giving you the, the specific language to explain why I said what I said. <laughs> but if you're designing something for the GM to use, first order optimal strategies are gold. Mm. The GM just has so much going on. And the GM may not be a strategic and tactical genius. And... The GM is outnumbered at the table five brains to one. I see, okay. yeah. And the GM has to parse a lot of information on every stat block. The GM is constantly learning how to play a new monster. So if you can build monsters that have very obvious optimal strategies built right into them, that are interesting, by the way. Not like the the most optimal strategy can't be, uh, and if it hits with this attack, it kills all the characters. <laughs> yeah, that's it's not what I'm saying. Is it's something like that zombie thing where as soon as you look at that character sheet, you could say, okay, this is the best way to play a zombie. Mm. Okay, you want GMs to be able to spot those things immediately because then it saves you thousands of words. Because now I don't have to explain my monster tactics. I just have to trust that the GM ha can do basic math and recognize 2d8 is a lot more than 1d4 <laughs> and then convince the GM that, yes, he really should be trying to kill the monsters or kill the players with the monsters. Mm. Because don't worry, the game is set up so that you really can't. <laughs> <True>. <laughs> and if you accidentally do, that's actually kind of on the players. It's so the player's job to figure out how to, not, how, how to not die. It's not your job. Your job is to force them to figure out how to not die. Hmm. Okay. Your job isn't to keep the players alive. Your job is to empower them to keep themselves alive or make them die trying. It's a good way of putting it. Well, it's because, I mean, look at, um, what's the fellow who does the, uh, the monsters know what they're doing? Right. Have you seen this? It sounds so familiar. Okay, it's a fantastic website that became a fantastic book. Okay, and I cannot remember the person's name, and I should. I have a computer in front of me, <laughs> and I could actually just tell you the name. But the, the premise is he goes through all the monsters in the monster manual. Well, he goes through one monster at a time in, in like blog format, and he looks at the monster. And he tells you the optimal strategies for to use for that monster. Tells you just how to play that monster. But he also has to spend a lot of time, at least in introductions and occasionally on social media and stuff, giving GMs permission to try and kill the characters. 
Mm-hmm. Because somebody got it into the the player's head or the GM's heads, and I don't know who this was, that the if the GM is trying as hard as they can, not trying as hard, wait, if the GM is trying as hard as they can to kill the characters with the monsters, they are a killer GM. <laughs> okay, and the thing is, my philosophy is build fair, play to win. Mm. If you build fair encounters, or reasonably fair encounters, and then play the encounter as if you're trying to actually, as if you're the monsters and you really want to beat the characters, as if your life depends on it, then you will challenge the players and the challenge the, the players will it's on them whether they win or not. But of course I get called a killer GM for espousing this too. <laughs> Keith Ammon, by the way, is the fellow's name. Uh yes, because I mean I actually just Googled um, but yeah, I recognize the book because I'm sure one of my players actually showed me this recently. Or um one of my DM friends. Well, you know, there's, it's a funny extension of an argument. Like, um, have you ever had the argument with with another GM about how, well, a wolf only has animal intelligence, so it wouldn't be smart enough to use its tactics? I actually haven't. Okay. There, there is this interesting argument that the a, a GM will look at the raw intelligence score on a particular monster and decide that ca- that animal is objectively unintelligent and therefore should fight stupid. I'm like, do you know hmm. anything about animals or evolution or wolves? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've heard similar kind of arguments used in discussions on how tactical a creature inherently would be. Like whether, uh, I think it was um, a Matthew Colville video. He was saying something like, if you want to justify keeping a player alive you can say that the creature might not be intelligent enough to do more than want to disable them and then move on to the next threat that kind of thing i think Uh, that's where i've heard that kind of argument come up yeah i I mean that that's an extension of the same thing but obviously it's silly though Mm. you know if if you have a hungry monster um if it if it is threatened obviously it is going to fight off the threats Um, if it has a ready source of food in front of it and it is threatened, it is going to continue to fight off the threats. You don't need to justify that like an owlbear wouldn't deliver a killing blow to a downed person if other people were still fighting it. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like it's not going to stop to have a snack, but when you get to intelligent monsters, then the, the dynamic changes. Like one of the things that makes orcs scary in my world, for example, Hmm. is that um, orcs are among the few humanoids that will make it a point to coup de gras a downed opponent. Hmm. They will kill a downed opponent. That's just how orcs are. They are just, they're savage. They sure. drop someone on the ground. They And also, some monsters are smart enough to recognize that once the party starts throwing healing magic around... Uh, Any downed opponent is potentially not downed next round. So, you know, but orcs and gnolls in particular in my world are savage enough that they they are known known for their coup de gras. Mm. Which, so now here's the interesting thing. If you go back to what I told you earlier about the what about this monster changes what the enemy, what changes what the players will do. Most players feel reasonably safe leaving someone on the ground for a couple of rounds, right? Sure. Like if the, if the fight's going really bad and someone goes down, they know that that person has at least two safe rounds before they're dead. <laughs> okay? Yeah. So when they're fighting an orc, what about fighting the orc changes what the players do? Now they know if they go down in front of that orc, Next round, that orc is taking out that person. Dead. Coup de gras. Dead, dead. Do they, ch- do they fight differently? You better believe they do. <laughs> Number one, I'll tell you, once players have figured out my orcs, uh, first thing is, very rarely does anyone go below zero hit points. 
<laughs> okay. Players are pretty blasé about getting dropped in a fight. It's like, oh, I got dropped. Somebody heal me. Oh, yeah. darn. Yeah. You know, and then they'll fight to the bitter end. You know, whereas when the players in my world are fighting my orcs, they, they're like, uh, I only have five hit points left. Uh, I'm going to retreat. You guys handle this orc. <laughs> Because they know if they drop, they have until that orc's next action mm. to the, before they die. And depending on how the initiative plays out, that could mean you drop your dead. True. You know, and I, I'm not apo- I don't apologize about that either. It's like, look, you, <laughs> this is how orcs are. You shouldn't have let yourself drop to zero hit points because you knew it was an issue here. Mm. <laughs> you know. So it's what about this monster changes what the players do. Yeah, it's great to have like the practical examples you're giving as well. Like it really helps me put it into context. Well, I'm glad to help out. <sighs> so mm-hmm. have we covered absolutely everything? Have we fixed D and D? Uh I'd say we're on our way. Like we might okay. need a might need a couple more <laughs> conversations, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I am always happy to come back. I mean we haven't even started on the Ranger. Oh, geez. I don't know. I don't even know what the ranger's supposed to be anymore. <laughs> Which means I'm now qualified to work at Wizards of the Coast. <laughs> One of their interview questions is, what's a ranger? And if you write anything other than I don't know, then they don't hire you. <laughs> it's one of those Google interviews. <laughs> oh, man. But no, I think this has been like really illuminating. Um, it's been very cool to be able to like hear your process of breaking down the uh, mechanics and like the fundamental psychology even behind the game design, which is really what I think is core to your work. Like it's the main reason that I've been following you for a while now. Like the reason I bought your Kickstarter book. Like, well, thank you. You have some really interesting <laughs> insights that I don't think other people necessarily uh, go into in the same way. Yeah, early, very early on that became, well, like originally um, when it all started, it was, I, I had an interesting idea for boss monsters in fourth edition. Hmm. And it wasn't until later on when I started trying, like I was trying to, to write, uh, okay, here's how you could write a mystery adventure. And I realized, well, I should really, really explain how to rethink skill checks. So I did that and I started explaining how to really, to rethink skill checks. And then I realized, then in that, I realized, you know what? I don't really understand how I think about skill checks. I know I think about them differently, but how? What's my thought process? Hmm. And as I, as I started to ask myself, what is happening in my own brain? in these different situations. And I finally wrote down the whole, like it, it, what really started me on that journey of breaking things down into the thought process was coming up with the basic rule for action adjudication, which is, you know, if you had, when a player declares an action, the first thing you do, ask yourself, can this succeed? Can this fail? Is there a cost or risk of attempting it such that they can't do it over and over again until it succeeds. Mm. Uh, uh, uh Uh-oh. Yeah. I mean, those are the three questions, right? Can it succeed? Can it, can it fail? You know, and, and, but that was basically the definition of the thought process of when do you roll a die? Hmm. Because if an action can succeed, but there's no chance it's going to fail, don't roll the dice. It works. Yeah. <laughs> if the cha- if the cha- if the action can't succeed but you know it's going to fail, don't roll the dice. And if the action can succeed and it can fail, but the player could just keep doing it over and over and over again until it succeeds, don't roll the dice. Cuz they'll just keep <laughs> doing it over and over again until it succeeds. True. Okay. Like um like the the lock picking question. I try to pick the lock, roll the dice. Okay, you failed. Can I try again? Sure. <laughs> Roll the dice. Why does that happen? Yeah. Uh, you know? You know, I if there's nothing in the situation that 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 changes, the player's not going to change their like I love the whole like the navigating and tracking roles. It's like 
you know, if, if someone is tr navigating across the wilderness or they're tracking a creature, you know, every hour have them make a roll again. Mm. It's like, why are we doing that if nothing changes? It's not like they're going to change their mind halfway through and be like, you know what? Eh, I don't need to track anymore. I, I tracked enough. I'm done. <laughs> if they're just going to keep doing it. There's no choice involved. Why roll a die about it? Just let the die roll cover the entire choice. Yeah. Unless something changes. You know, if the party goes to sleep, they wake up the next day. They don't know what the weather is going to be. That could destroy the trails. Plus, every day that they don't follow a trail through the wilderness, the trail goes colder. You know, so when it's getting late, at, and, you know, when it's starting to get dark and it's dangerous to travel at night because you'll fall into an unseen ravine and break a leg, uh, then the party starts to get nervous about, well, if we don't follow the trail, then we could lose the trail. But if we do follow the trail, we could fall into a ravine and break our leg. Or worse yet, at four in the morning when we're all suffering from exhaustion, we could find the thing that made the trail. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. None of those are good situations. See, but you know, they, but until then, it's like, why roll tracking checks over and over again? Why roll navigation checks over and over again? Yeah, and it's Nothing. something I actually have to tell my players when they're starting to DM um, is that if there is anything in the game that you need to happen, don't make it a check. <laughs> Cause like, what do you do when they need the key to open the door to continue the story and get the whatever? If you make it a check to find the key, they haven't found it. So what does your story end? <laughs> well, okay. See now, uh, now I want to come at you. <laughs> Cause I have different advice. If you as a GM are writing a story that requires something to happen to proceed, you're writing a novel, not a role-playing game. That is true. <laughs> yeah. It's like if they need the if they need a key that it, that is hidden behind a door and they, you know, they have to roll to break down the door, um then if I'm not prepared to handle what happens in the game when they don't get the key, then I have not written a role-playing game. Mm. Okay. So you have to do one of two things. You either have to figure out what happens when they don't get the key, which by the way, could be, they lose the adventure. The princess is sacrificed to the archdevil. They didn't get there in time. Whoopsie doodle. Dad's mad now. <laughs> <laughs> you know. <laughs> also archdevil. <laughs> you know? like, sure. Sure. <laughs> it's, it's okay for that, for them to lose which is something mo many GMs never consider. Like, ooh, because you just said it there yourself. You said it very flippantly, but it's like, what happens? The story ends. And it's like, the story doesn't end unless you stop playing. Mm, true. What you really <laughs> need to ask yourself as a GM is what happens in the world when the players don't have that key? That's really good. <laughs> yeah. It's okay if they don't get the key. It's okay if they don't win the adventure. But... You better think about it, what happens next, or you better be really good at improvising what happens next. Mm. And I mean, there, there's another flaw. I've, I've said this before. Um, if like, so you're going to sacrifice the prince to the, to the archdevil. Um, you know, that's the cult's goal. Feed mm -hmm. the archdevil with the prince's soul or whatever. And then the archdevil is going to rise and destroy the world. Okay. As a GM, you better be prepared to figure out what happens the day after the archdevil rises. Mm. You better be prepared to figure out how the world proceeds without the prince in it. Because you as a GM should never point your GM gun at anything you're not prepared to pull the trigger on. That's a good way of putting it. You want to threaten something in the world? You want to threaten the players with a consequence? You better be ready to carry through. <laughs> Okay. And if the consequence is the world is destroyed, you better be ready to start a new campaign tomorrow. <laughs> and I, you know, I've done that too. I have had games where the destruction of the world was on the line and the players screwed up and I destroyed the world. It's like, all right, starting a new <laughs> campaign tomorrow. <laughs> what? Like, if you didn't win this adventure, the archdevil destroys the world. You didn't win the adventure, therefore, dot, 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 
Figure it out yourselves. Everyone decide what you want to play for the next game. I'll come up with a plot. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> Jesus. Well, I, otherwise, don't threaten it. No, Anything else is railroading. It's fair, yeah. And I mean, you know? <laughs> a big reason why my last campaign actually stopped running was because I realized that I had basically been writing a novel and nothing the players did had any meaningful outcomes. They were just kind of playing through different pre-written stories and none of them were enjoying it. Um, I believe, again, to bring up Colville, who did a whole video on um, the railroad versus the sandbox and using like Lord of the Rings as the examples. Um, like, I think I'd seen it a couple of times and thought to myself, well, my players have meaningful choices. They can choose to go down this way or that way. But I was overlooking the fact that no matter which direction they went, they ended up at the same place doing the same thing. And like, I'd already written like what the final level 20 boss mm -hmm. was going to be. <laughs> By the way, though, it's okay to do that. Okay, it's okay to know who the boss of the campaign is going to be. It's okay to plan out the campaign. As long as the minute the players do something to screw up the plan, you change the plan. Mm. And that was the problem, okay. I think, because yeah. I was just finding ways to get them back on course. <laughs> uh-huh. And yeah. Which, now, the counterpoint because I will never make an argument without arguing with myself. <laughs> the counterpoint to this is also, to some extent, it is okay to railroad your players and keep the game going along a certain course hmm. because everybody agreed to play that game. If the game is about saving the world from the archdevil, okay, and the players decide partway through, to ignore the archdevil plot and open their own noodle shop. <laughs> I have every right to stop the game and say, you know what? This isn't the game we all agreed we were going to play. I don't want to run four monks, one noodle shop. It's an amusing story, but that's not why I got into D and D. Sure. Okay. Uh, I wrote this campaign about an archdevil and you all agreed. That sounded like a cool idea. So get yourselves back on track or we scrap the game and I'm going to run something else. <laughs> that we all agree on. <laughs> you know, True. so True. The, it is okay to bring things back in line. Okay. Sure. It, but, you know, you, uh, in my book, I, I mentioned that there are three basic pillars to the game, right? Mm. There's engagement, agency, and consistency. Okay. The uh, engagement is obviously how you keep the game entertaining, how you keep the players interested and emotionally invested in the game. Consistency is the fact that the world works a certain way. The players can learn how the world works. Um, the rules are applied the same way, all of that stuff, so that there is persistence from game to game to game, and the players can form logical plans instead of having to behave at random because they never know what whim you're going to follow that day. <laughs> An agency is the fact that the players know that whatever outcome the game has, it's the outcome they earned. Mm. Okay. And, and that's, that is the key, by the way. And like people think railroading is about freedom of choice. And I don't even like to use the word railroading. Okay. It's not about freedom of choice. An agency isn't about freedom of choice necessarily. Okay. It is about the fact that the, at the end of the day, the players feel like whatever happened in the game followed from the choices they made. Mm. Okay. And I'll point this out too. Okay. So let's take a simple railroad versus sandbox adventure. Okay. Sure. So rail, railroad adventure, the players are hired by this village to go kill a dragon that has been threatening the village. They go through the wilderness to the dragon's cave, fight through the kobolds in the cave, eventually confront the dragon, kill the dragon. Simple, linear adventure. Sure. Okay. Now let's take a sandbox. Okay. There's six villages on the map. The players have basically a vague map. They know where some of the villages are. They stop wandering around the countryside. They come to the village. While they're in the village, they hear several people talking about how they are so downtrodden because the dragon keeps attacking them. Mm. 
They become interested in this idea. So they ask, you know, you know they say to the, the townsfolk, we would like to help you with your problem because they have decided to do that. Mm-hmm. At which point, they travel through the wilderness to the dragon's cave, kill the kobolds in the dragon's cave, confront the dragon and kill it. The end. <laughs> yeah. Okay. The only difference between a sandbox and a linear game, or once the players in a sandbox have found a goal they like and choose it, it is indistinguishable from a linear game. True. Okay. The, the, the distinction between a sandbox game and a linear game is the GM is going to scatter some number of goals around the map and leave it up to the players to decide which goal to choose or to choose none of the above. Mm. Because if the players just want to keep wandering around the map, finding the next thing, they can do that. Okay. Yeah, they're but choosing which rails they want to ride. Right. Which is why, again, I say get get the word railroading out of your vocabulary. Because mm. it's at the end of the day, it's about, you know, they choose a goal, they pursue it. You know, sometimes a goal is very easy to pursue. Sometimes it is very obvious how you do it. There is a dragon in that cave. There's a very simple solution to the problem. (laughs) (laughs) Go to the cave, you kill the dragon. Nobody's nobody's not going to follow through with that. Sure. Okay. Um, But here is a here is an ancient ruin. And we would like it mapped, says the cartographer's guild. Here's some blank paper. Now the players can kind of explore at their own at their own pleasure, and go wherever they want, and you know, and deal with whatever challenges they want, run away from whatever challenges they want, and just handle it their own way. Hmm. You know, there's nothing that makes one of those things linear or sandboxy. It's just uh, you know, it's it's basically it's a, it's a matter of the structure of the adventure. And individual components of an adventure can be structured differently. Like you, you zoom out on the, on the sandbox adventure and you have an open structure that leads to several branching or linear structures buried in there, nested inside the game. Exactly. You know, there are certain dungeons to explore. So we go explore those dungeons, what have you. So I, I wouldn't worry too much about the whole railroading thing and the railroading versus sandbox question because it's, I mean, it is, Nice as a GM who's writing your own adventures to have a concept of adventure structure and know the different ways to join up an adventure. Mm. You know, open, branching, reverse branching, like a pyramid structure, a linear structure, you know. For sure. Or or if you watch um, Mark Brown's Boss Keys series, he talks about what, find the path dungeons and follow the path dungeons. I love that show. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, he's really good. Um, you know, but that boss key series is invaluable for for adventure design stuff. Mm. Because well, one of the secrets of, of it is if you view every dungeon map that he talks about as a flowchart for anything instead of a dungeon map, <laughs> then you can structure any adventure that way. True. Like you you can structure a murder mystery on the Dancing Dragon Cave from Legend of Zelda Oracle of Ages. <laughs> you can use the same flowchart for a murder mystery. That's a great point, actually, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think now is probably a good time to throw in the homebrew challenge. <laughs> because I haven't thrown out enough ideas already of things that people could build at home, sure. I know, I was thinking, like, <laughs> well, do we really need one? We've already had, like... <laughs> No, I, I don't mind it at all. It actually sounds like fun. So if you want to, if you want to do it to have it, I'm all, I'm game. It's, it's entirely on you. Okay. But if I roll a natural 20, we're going to finish redesigning D&D. <laughs> <laughs> the natural 20 is come up with a new edition. <laughs> <laughs> well, I could do that, but you have to sign an NDA again. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so for those who are new to the show, basically we're going to do a little homebrew challenge. I'm going to roll 1d20, and depending on which number tells me which item or location or monster, like some kind of a concept that I'm going to throw to Mr. Angry in order to get him to come up with some crazy idea on the spot. So here we go. Oh, that is a natural 20. (laughs) (laughs) 
All right, so ch- chapter one, what is a role-playing game? So here's where I would start with th- <laughs> Oh, no. <laughs> no, no, thankfully, 20 is, in fact, a location. <laughs> uh, a location. But actually, now that we've said that, I think we had location on the last episode. So I'm going to drop one and we'll try a spell instead. A spell. Mm. Um, uh, uh, just anything like no, no constraints, no fey attachment or something. Oh, man. I'm happy to give you some constraints if you would like them. <laughs> Blank page syndrome is the worst here. <laughs> um, let's say it is a spell related to communication. Communication, huh? Um. Let's see. And this is a problem because now, like, you try to, th- as soon as you try to think of the idea, the first <laughs> thing you have to think of is, has it ever existed in any game ever? Mm. Do you know? Um, well, there are certainly a few uh, messaging spells in D&D that were very popular. Right. And there's certainly sending an animal messenger and stuff like that. Um, mm. And then there's also the the telepathic stuff so what sort of messaging isn't there in D? Mm. you know okay so here here's an idea mm-hmm. because one of the things that used to exist in D was alignment languages oh yeah okay yeah there were there used to be a, a lawful language and a chaotic language and a neutral language which was <laughs> very ambivalent and went back and forth a lot but um <laughs> And it is very easy for a spellcaster to to communicate with, directly with one person with a spell like like the like the, the spell that lets a warlock or it might even be a class feature that lets the warlock just whisper into somebody else's head. Yes. But what it would really be nice would be to have some sort of contingent communication spell, whereas a a wizard or, or as maybe as a bard even cast the spell could specify a particular condition, a trait or quality or something that he specifically wanted to be able to understand or not understand the message that he was just about to say. So what I'm saying, okay, so if the person wants to specify only, only their allies and speak out loud, so then they cast a spell and then they can speak a sentence and their allies will hear exactly whatever they say. And anybody who is not one of their allies will hear incomprehensible babble or it, it, like sound like they're speaking in tongues. Hmm. You know, so, you know, if they're or if they want to make a general announcement to an audience, they, they're about to be hung and they know there are a bunch of rebels in the in the audience watching, <laughs> just waiting for a signal. Then with their last words, they cast this spell and then they speak something only the only people who are members of the of the red brands can understand. Everybody else will just hear this incomprehensible babble and the red brands will hear, you know, on my command, ignite the powder. <laughs> That's you know? fantastic. Yeah. Something like that. Just a on the fly contingent communication spell. That would be cool. Hmm. Very cool. All right. So, yeah, I think that is probably going to bring us to a close then. But no, thank you very much for coming, man. Like, it's been a fantastic conversation. You've certainly elucidated a lot for me. And I think no doubt displayed your prowess to the audience. (laughs) (laughs) Well, thank you very much for having me. It's been a lot of fun. It has been a fantastic conversation. Um, And hopefully we'll get the chance to do it again sometime. Yeah, I would love to. I mean, we didn't touch on any of the topics I had written down. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, I didn't even get to ask you why they call you angry. <laughs> you don't want to ask me that. I still have the A order of the last person who asked me that in a jar. Oh, wow. <laughs> uh, but yeah, um, I think 
it would be lovely to have you on again. Uh, hopefully we could talk maybe a little bit about how you've been approaching D&D as a business, uh, your like, uh, Mad Hatter approach to design and uh, what it was like working on a Kickstarter. Yeah, I would love to talk about all of that stuff. It was, um, it was all very uh, educational mm. since I pretty much just muddled through everything. Well, I feel like I should probably pay you or something because it felt like I was taking notes on a course. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you definitely taught me a lot today and I appreciate that. That's part of the joy of having these conversations is it helps me be a better DM by learning from others. And you know, what's funny too is in discussing this stuff, um, I get a better handle on the way I'm viewing it. As, as I said to you, a lot of times when we're talking about these things, I'm not really having a conversation. I'm just thinking out loud. You mm. sort of work things out as you talk. So it, it's, it's very helpful just to have the opportunity to talk through this stuff, you know, and there, there are certainly things that have come out of this that now I have to think, think long and hard about too, you know. Plus, plus that entumor fight. I really want to steal that idea. <laughs> See what I can do with it. Yeah, man. Three point five had some crazy mechanics. <laughs> yeah, and you know what? Those those are the ones that really really stand out. Is the 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 creature that has like for the, no? You know what? I'm gonna talk for another <laughs> half hour if we do this. You so. must slip right back into it. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's too easy to get me to do that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay well let's sign off here um thank you very much again and uh we'll chat again soon <laughs> thank you and that brings us to the end of this small journey thanks again to angry for joining us and if you want to check out his work head on over to theangrygm.com there's a discount code in the description for his book along with the store link. Uh, it's not a paid promotion. And if you've listened to all three episodes, I hope you have an appreciation for why I picked the book up. It's a great resource. And if you like what you heard here, there's plenty more to be found in those pages as well as on the website. Last but not least, thank you for making it to the end of the video. And until the next adventure, stay safe and have a Merry Christmas.